thank uh, Mary Grace for inviting me again to the Sussex Library, and I'm looking forward to maybe one day speaking up there because my son who goes skiing not far from there says it's a gorgeous area of New Jersey. And he said, uh, you and, and his, my wife, his mother, would really enjoy just uh, going through the countryside. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner, and uh, I've been doing uh, this type of thing, speaking to the public since 1971 professionally. Uh, over in Rockland County, I was at Spring Valley High School in 11th grade. I had a teacher by the name of Joe Dionisio who said, student, student, you have a good voice. How would you like to be on radio? And I said, I want to be on radio the worst way. And I was. I was on part of uh, a show called Tiger Talk, which was the Spring Valley High School show, which was on WRKL radio, 910 on the dial, uh, which you should be able to get the frequency anyway. Uh, in your neck of the woods. I also uh, had the door open for me to work at the uh, Nyack Journal News and the Hackensack Bergen Record. I did three separate stints at the Bergen Record uh, while I was in high school, after college, and uh, also uh, at the turn of the century doing op-ed pieces for Peter Grad. Um, I got onto WNEW radio in uh, March of 1978, quite by accident. Uh, John Lindsay, the former mayor of New York, uh, came up to Nyack. I was covering a New York Democratic fundraiser, and he came up to me and said, I'm running for Senate in 1980. And uh, he told me that WNEW, after I fed it to uh, UPI and AP, called me up. Henry Marcotte said, how would you like to sell us that story? I said, how much are you going to pay me? They said, 10 bucks. I said, sold. And uh, I was with WNEW until they gutted the newsroom in 1982. Among the people that uh, I interviewed for WNEW, uh, Ronald Reagan, Ted Kennedy over at the Mawa Ford plant when uh, that thing was going out of business. And I covered the returning Iranian hostages 40 years ago up at Stewart Air Force Base in Newburgh. Um, I mentioned WNEW because that guy there eating the banana and I do remind him every once in a while about this interview and this picture that uh, he was eating a banana and paying more attention to the banana than the question that uh, I had just asked him. And then I'm asking him to answer while he's got a banana in his mouth or chewing the banana in his mouth is Phil Sims, New York Giants. And um, around that time, uh, New York Giants games were done on WNEW. Uh, Jim Gordon was the announcer, who was a lovely classly, classy man. Uh, Phil Simms was the MVP of the Super Bowl, the January 1987 Super Bowl, when the Giants defeated the Denver Broncos. And uh, before I go on, if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat, and I'll try to answer them as we go, or we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, so, Super Bowl. Uh, the Super Bowl is a big deal. It's a big party weekend this weekend under normal circumstances. Of course, there's COVID this weekend, which may uh, tamper down the parties. But the Super Bowl was created by Congress, by the Senate and the House of Representatives. It took an act of Congress to create the Super Bowl, which allowed the merger of the American Football League and the National Football League. The merger was tacked on to an anti-inflation bill. Signed into law by President Lyndon B. Johnson, November 8th, 1966. Now, before I get on to talk about how this game came about, I'm going to talk a little bit about the security because uh, in most years, this is the most secure event in the United States. Uh, this year, it's not. It took second to the presidential inaugural, and that's what happens. It happened in 2017, 2013. 2009, 2005, 2001. Um, the Secret Service is the lead agency on uh, security for the Super Bowl. And isn't that a nice little badge? Look at that little badge. Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. Uh, and that, is, uh, out, that is the county that serves Tampa, and they got their little Super Bowl insignia on their badge. There are offices wearing that badge in the Tampa area, Super Bowl 55 the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. Uh, the Super Bowl is a special events assessment rating level one event. Uh, 50 agencies have been working together for a year and a half in the Tampa area, and really the last two and a half years in Florida because Miami, uh, the Miami area had the game last year. It takes about a year and a half 
to fully secure a Super Bowl. Uh, there is no word on how much it costs taxpayers to provide security. The NFL doesn't pay any money to help secure the event. The FBI, FEMA, TSA, the Customs and Border Patrol, their main job is to crack down on counterfeit merchandise. Don't put a logo on the t-shirt and try to sell it at a fan fest or in front of the stadium or the Customs and Border Patrol is going to crack down on you. Uh, the local police, this time Tampa Police, Hillsborough County Police, uh, rather the uh, county, yeah, the county police, uh, along with maybe Polk County and uh, Pinellas County Police, along with the Florida State Troopers are all part of the security team. Now, this picture looks like a bunch of guys waiting around at an airport counter for tickets. And if you said that these guys are standing around waiting for tickets at an airport counter, you're absolutely correct. Uh, this is a scene in New Orleans. It was supposed to be New Orleans, the home of the American Football League All-Star Game in January 1965. And at that time, the American Football League, which was founded by Lamar Hunt in 1960, actually 1959, the first year was 1960. Uh, the AFL was looking for another city to go with the nine cities that they had, eight cities that they had for a ninth team. And um, New Orleans was going to get that team, but um, they didn't. Uh, mice and men, plans of mice and men often go awry. And this time, they really want to ride. That's Butch Berg. He was a defensive back with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, he's to the right in front of that old rotary phone or back of the old rotary phone. Uh, behind him in the fedora looking ahead is Earl Faison, who played with San Diego. I'm not sure who this guy is with the glasses, his hand uh, over his ear with the fedora. Curtis McClinton is uh, there with the fedora with what looks like airport tickets or airline tickets in hand. They're leaving New Orleans. They were told, go down to New Orleans, play an all-star game, have a good time, and pretty much we're going to give you a football team. All you have to do is show up, and then we'll make the grand announcement, New Orleans has a team. But it didn't work that way. A uh, quick background to the Super Bowl and how it started. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, Jim Crow, New Orleans, and players boycott. Senator Russell Long of Louisiana, Representative Hale Boggs, also of Louisiana, the father of uh, the late Cokie Roberts, who was at uh, NPR and ABC for a while. Uh, the representative from Brooklyn, Emanuel Seller, all part of the Super Bowl creation by accident and design. Ron Mix played with the San Diego Chargers uh, during the AFL run. He started with the Los Angeles Chargers in 1960. Baron Hilton moved that team to San Diego in 1961. The league lasted between 1960 and 1969. And Ron Mix was part of what was the New Orleans boycott. And about seven years ago, I gave him a call um, asking him about what was going on with the National Basketball Association. Uh, with the Los Angeles Clippers owner, Donald Sterling, who told his mistress uh, that he didn't want black guys at his games anymore. And he said, please don't bring any black guys anymore. I don't want them around. Uh, I know you're, they're your friends, but I don't want them around. Well, the Clippers players heard about that. And uh, they heard about it because uh, his mistress leaked the tape to TMZ, uh, Harvey Levin, and Harvey put it on his website, then the TV show. And the players heard about that and said, we're not playing for him anymore. We're going to boycott the NBA playoffs. We just don't want them. We're not playing till you get rid of them. Well, the, it was made easy for the NBA to get rid of him because all the marketing partners left the Los Angeles Clippers. And Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA, was able to just pull the rug from Donald Sterling and take the franchise away. So I asked Ron Mix, who was part of the 1965 boycott, uh, and a lawyer, still is a lawyer, he's about 83 years old. And I said, what was the difference between what they did in 2014 or what they're doing right now? Because this was 2014, did a story for the Daily Beast. And uh, what you did in 1965, and they said, it's apples and oranges, two totally different things. Um, they were disrespected by their owner. Um, we were fighting for a cause, the civil rights cause in 1965. 
we were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game. And to demonstrate to the American Football League and the National Football League, they, New Orleans, could support the football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was a system in demonstrating they could support the franchise. A boycott was the only alternative for the players. Uh, but it wasn't the first boycott ever in New Orleans. In fact, uh, it wasn't the first sports protest. This guy, Walter Beach, a one-man protest. Walter Beach was with the American Football League Boston Patriots. He signed the contract in 1960 after graduating from Central Michigan University. We have one thing in common, Walter Beach and I. He went to Central Michigan University and I gave a talk at Central Michigan University in 1999. Walter Beach told his uh, coach, Mike Holovic, and his owner, Billy Sullivan, the owner of the Boston Patriots, he said, look, I'm a football player and we're going down to New Orleans to play a preseason game and I expect equal treatment with the white guys. I don't expect a Green Book treatment. Now, the Green Book, you might have it, the DVD in the library. The Green Book, which was put out in 1935 by a guy in Harlem, which was a guide for Negroes, uh, also put out by the AAA, distributed by AAA. It was a guide for Negroes to where they could stay, where they could eat, where they could get gas while driving around the country. Walter Beach said, I'm a football player. I'm going to stay with my teammates. No segregated living conditions for our road trip in New Orleans. I'm not going to stay with a host family. I'm not going to go with a bus to meet them. I'm not going to eat at their house. Um, and he talked to the other black players on uh, the Patriots about protesting and not playing in the game because of Jim Crow. Well, Billy Sullivan and Mike Holovic would have none of that. And they fired him on the spot. They labeled him a troublemaker for organizing a protest among the black players fighting Jim Crow. Uh, Walter Beach would sign a contract with the Cleveland Browns in 1962. He would play with their championship team. And uh, he continued his civil rights activists to this day, he's still a uh, civil rights activist. Um, after Muhammad Ali was stripped of his boxing title and his uh, license uh, to fight by the New York State Athletic Commission, he had nowhere to go because he refused induction into the army. He lost his livelihood. And Jim Brown in Cleveland, my buddy Walt Flea Roberts in Cleveland, Walter Beach, a very young uh, Lou Alcindor, uh, held this thing called the Cleveland Summit. And uh, they interviewed Ali to find out if he was legitimate, if he really was a conscientious objector to the war. And they said he was legitimate. Uh, Walter Beach and Jim Brown have continued all these years. You know, you're talking 60 years now of uh, civil rights activism. Um, so Walter Beach actually did okay after being fired. He ended up with Cleveland on a championship team. Cookie Gilchrist was a running back with the Buffalo Bills. And he was able to get a cab from the airport in New Orleans to the Hotel uh, Fountain Blue or the Hotel Roosevelt, whichever one he was staying at. But there was an old Jim Crow custom in New Orleans. If you were colored, you couldn't get a cab. However, if you were colored and a white guy was with you and the white guy hailed the cab, you could get into the cab with the white guy who took responsibility for whatever actions that you did while in the cab. Cookie Girl Chris was an all-star, AFL all-star. Uh, what was happening was, let's go down to New Orleans and let's have a good time. It was promised to them by the city leaders, David Dixon, by the governor of the state of Louisiana, by the mayor of uh, New Orleans. Come on down, bring your families down. You're gonna have a good time this week. We're gonna show you a good time. And even the 22 black guys, you come on down, we're gonna, Greet you with open arms. Segregation, gone. Jim Crow, just ending. And we want a professional football team. We desperately want a professional football team. The AFL had an awful lot of black guys on the roster, considering the NFL had a quota of four black guys per team uh, in the 1950s into the 1960s. And one team, Washington, didn't even hire black guys. Uh, Washington was forced to hire a black guy uh, because of the Kennedy administration, because of Stuart Udell, the uh, Secretary of the Interior, who told the Washington owner, George Preston Marshall, you want to move into the federally funded stadium that we're building, 
in will open in 1962, you better have hired uh, Negro players, which George Preston Marshall, who was not apologetic about being a racist, did because he liked money more than being a racist. So this was a state of uh, football in those days. Uh, if you look at this picture, you will see this is from the All-Star Game in San Diego back in 1963. Um, the two coaches, Henry, Hank Schramm up there, Pop Ivy, but you'll see eight players. And of the eight players, three of them are African-Americans, Cookie Gilchrist, Earl Faison, and Fred the Hammer Williamson. Uh, the AFL had black players. And why? Why did they have black players? Well, the league starts in 1959. They need uh, players in 1960. And the AFL was the only sports league at the time. And you're talking about the early 1960s to truly embrace African-American athletes as an equal on the field with white players. They needed players. Uh, they got players from the Canadian Football League. Uh, George Blanda uh, quit the Chicago Bears, retired after 1958. He sat out a year. He came back to Houston in 1960. And they were getting guys off the streets, and they were getting guys from the historic black colleges who fielded great football teams, although the NFL didn't realize that because they didn't bother looking for black players. It just wasn't something that they were too interested in. AFL found the black players. The NFL scouts, they went to the big-time schools and conferences, the Big Ten and the schools in the South. Meanwhile, the AFL looked for players with a different background, Grambling University in Louisiana, Bethune-Cookman in Florida, Prairie View uh, in Texas, uh, North, uh, North Carolina 18, A&T, North Carolina, uh, Texas A&I, uh, Morgan State in um, Maryland, and they found players, and they found really good players. Uh, Irv Cross, who was uh, on NFL Today back in the 70s and 80s, who's an old buddy of mine, uh, I checked in with him after COVID broke out because I wanted to see how he was doing, 79 years old and all. And he says, how's it going? I'm doing okay. How's it going? I said, fine. He said, what you talking about? I said, I just did a whole uh, series on the Super Bowl. Uh, and I talked about uh, the AFL and uh, how they had black players. And, and you had the quote. And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, uh, just let me think for a second. My first year of Philadelphia, 1961. Uh, there was me, it was Ted Dean, there was uh, Clarence Peaks and Tim Brown. Yeah, four. There you go. The four. We were the four. Uh, that wasn't uh, the problem in the AFL. Ironically, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 destroyed the black college football programs as the best players could attend the big schools like Alabama or Texas or Louisiana State or Mississippi or Oklahoma or Arkansas or Tennessee or Georgia or North Carolina, South Carolina, University of Miami. Uh, Florida State in Florida. Um, those players could go to the football factories, although the traditional black schools, historic black schools, were football factories. That's my buddy Abner Haynes. Abner is about 83, 84 years old, lives in Dallas now, and about seven, eight years ago, he, he asked me, he said, you want to write a book with me? I want to do my biography. I said, Abner, I don't think I'd do it justice. I said, I could write 800 words, put them together, a coherent op-ed piece. I could do that. I could do a 40-second radio spot complete with an actuality, a voice in there, and do it and do it in 40 seconds. Biography, that night, that might not be for me. I may not be the guy for a biography. Uh, but anyway, he told me stories, a lot of stories. He was the uh, first African-American to regularly play college football in the state of Texas in 1956 at North Texas University. Uh, he was drafted by Pittsburgh in the NFL and the Dallas Texans no longer exist. They moved to Kansas City after 1962. Uh, in the AFL, he was uh, one of the first Negro captains in pro football with, Tex with the Texans in 1961. Told me a lot of stories. For our purposes here, only one story I'm going to give you. That's the AFL All-Star Game in New Orleans in 1965. Abner said that he was told by the Kansas City owner, Lamar Hunt, name, rank, and serial number. That's it. Abner Haynes, running back, Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, here for the American Football League All-Star Game. Uh, so he's waiting for this cab with 
about 18 others waiting for a cab to get into New Orleans. Uh, and he's waiting, waiting, and waiting. It's three and a half hours. Somebody gets a hold of somebody in, in uh, New Orleans connected with the American Football League and says, uh, hey, we got a bunch of guys sitting at the airport. They have no rides. The white players all got rides. We didn't get any rides. Um, Jack Kemp finds out, calls Bud Adams, the owner of the Houston Oilers, one of the co-founders of the American Football League. And um, Bud calls the governor of Louisiana, calls the mayor of New Orleans and says, our guys are out there. Where are the cabs? You promised us. You promised us everything would be great. What happened? The governor of Louisiana says, let's get the colored cabs for the colored players and get them in. They picked it up. Uh, and Abner and David Grayson get a ride together. David Grayson's with the Kansas City Chiefs. David Grayson, defensive back, Kansas City Chiefs, American Football League all-star team, and they get to the Hotel Roosevelt. They have no problems checking in. Then they go to the elevator and they encounter what everybody else was encountering, uh, name calling. Um, Abner gets to the elevator. It's this old type elevator where the door flings open and there's a fence or a gate and somebody is sitting in the seat operating the crank, making it go up and down. And he says to me, it's an old white lady. And she looks at him and she looks at David and says, hey, monkeys, what are you doing here? The rest of the story is from Abner Haynes. They had a woman operating the elevator and she said, you monkeys, come on in and get to the back. Finally, we had 10 or 12 guys in my room. We're talking sensibly. We're going to stay together. This is another test. Well, Abner didn't have it so bad. He just had to wait for a hotel, and he was only called a monkey with David Grayson. There were a couple of players that actually faced their mortality in New Orleans, particularly Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd was six foot nine, weighed 315 pounds, played with the San Diego Chargers. And he's going out with his teammates, Earl Faison and Dick Westmoreland, and they're going, what you do in New Orleans? You go to Bourbon Street and have a good time. And they walk into a place, and this bouncer says to them, I wouldn't come in here if I were you. And Ernie Ladd, all 6'9", 315 pounds, not afraid of anybody coming in. No big deal. He's coming in. And the bouncer says, I, I, if I were you, I wouldn't be coming in here. Somebody saw a gun. The bouncer all of a sudden got a lot of courage, and those guys fled. So all these guys are beginning to tell all kinds of stories among each other. And they decided they're going to have to do something about it. Abner, we had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we were playing for progress. Football players took the lead. And I said, well, there was Randolph with uh, FDR in 1941 and W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, There was Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King. But then he pointed out, and correctly, in the sports world, football players took the lead. Walter Beach took the lead in Boston back in 1961. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, Miami were death holes. Dave Grayson couldn't get a drink at the bar. Our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us, like him. Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp ran for president or attempted to run for president in 1980. He was uh, the vice presidential candidate in 1996. Uh, It was the Bob Dole Jack Kemp ticket against Bill Clinton and Al Gore back in 1996. Jack Kemp in 1965 was the quarterback with the Buffalo Bills. He was also the president of the American Football League Players Association, and he also had political aspirations. He was a Barry Goldwater delegate at the Republican Convention, and he campaigned for Goldwater in Western New York. When I was talking to him in Spark Hill, New York in 1979, May of 1979, this picture is from, Um, He was candidate Kemp looking to run for president and told me all about his political platform. But we we started a relationship after that, which lasted 30 years. And it was thanks to football talking about this. And um, Kemp put not only his football career on the line, but his political career on the line by supporting the black players in New Orleans. Um, What happened? Um, the white players went to practice. The black players didn't, but Kemp stayed around as did Ron Mix, Ron Mix being a lawyer, to see what was going on with the black players. The black players met and Kemp kind of knew 
and everybody else kind of knew the black players weren't going to play. Remember, this is still the height of the civil rights era. And uh, even though they kind of said, well, maybe you should play, you know, and all this other stuff, they kind of knew that whatever they're going to say wasn't going to make any difference. And they basically told the guys, whatever you do, we'll support you. So they, these guys put their careers on the line and him, his political career on the line. And uh, getting back to that picture, uh, he, I gave that picture to him years later. He said, you want me to sign that? I said, yeah, sure, sign it. And then he looks at me and he said, what happened to your hair? He said, what happened to your wig? It's powder gray now. 2003, Arizona Biltmore in an NFL owners meeting. My son is with me. And uh, Jack says to him, what do you want to drink? I said, Jack, he's 17 years old. He's underage. Said, shut up. What do you want to drink? I said, Jack, he's underage. I said, shut up. You want anything? He takes him to the bar, gives him his first illegal, legal, illegal drink. And uh, that's my, my son. Uh, <laughs> my son got his first illegal, illegal drink from Jack Kemp who ran for vice president in 1996. And uh, like I said, I have a 30 year relationship with him. One of the things getting back to Abner Haynes, we needed was the unity of the white players and black players for our new league. When the white players, Kemp, Jerry Mays, who was our Kansas City uh, defensive leader, four or five other guys, including Mix, heard about what was happening, their character showed and my teammates looked after me. Um, there was no official vote. There's nothing, uh, these guys had a meeting, there's absolutely nothing memori uh, memorialized from that meeting. Uh, the guys just came out and said, we're not playing. Kemp told the Houston Oilers um, owner, Bud Adams, we're not playing. Everybody goes home. Two days later, everybody uh, reconvenes in Houston and they have an all-star game, but New Orleans is not getting a team. Dave Dixon was a bitter man. He was the guy who wanted the football team, and he invited everybody to New Orleans and told Lamar Hunt, told Bud Adams, told the players, hey, come down here, you're going to have a good time, and we will buy a team. Dixon would tell the New York Times the boycotters had unjustly sullied New Orleans' reputation, complaining their militant action would not only damage the city, but would greatly retard efforts by men of goodwill of both races to achieve harmony. New Orleans is finished. AFL doesn't want them, and the NFL looks and sees what's happening on the ground in New Orleans. They don't want them either. But things change in a hurry. New Orleans is on the outside looking in, but New Orleans would eventually become a political pawn, and the Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott. Um, Sonny Werblin, the Rutgers graduate who owned the New York Jets, Sonny Werblin was able to pay big money to Joe Namath in 1965, three years, $427,000, a deal done between Jimmy Walsh, Namath's agent, and Jimmy comes back in this talk later on, and Sonny Werblin. Uh, NBC, David Sarnoff, gave Werblin and the AFL owners $35 million over five years because David Sarnoff didn't get the rights to the NFL on TV. He tells Werblin, who had known uh, uh, Sarnoff for a long time because uh, Werblin was Elizabeth Taylor's PR person. And Werblin also worked for MCA, for Lou Wasserman, MCA TV. And Wasserman did shows like Leave it to Beaver and The Monsters and others. And they were pitching those shows to networks. So Werblin knew Sarnoff. And um, Sarnoff calls Werblin and says, how much did they give? Uh, that SOB at CBS, William Paley, who founded CBS in 1927 with WCAU Radio, how much did that SOB give them? And he said, $35 million. He said, here's $35 million plus one, go buy yourself a league. And with that money, uh, Joe Namath and others were signed by the American Football League. And there was a bidding war for players. And the owners said they couldn't afford it in both leagues. So Texas E. Schramm, the president of the Dallas Cowboys. Sorry about that, Giants fans. I know I shouldn't. This is polite company, and I shouldn't bring that name up. It was Tex Schramm who actually gave the Dallas Cowboys uh, the nickname America's Team, which they aren't, but Tex said they were. And he did that after the uh, Kennedy assassination because 
Dallas's reputation was, of course, really low, and he wanted to boost up the reputation, and he figured, well, we'll call our team America's team. Uh, so anyway, Tech Tran from the Dallas Cowboys and Lamar Hunt from the Kansas City Chiefs, Lamar is living in Dallas, uh, decide they're going to meet. And they go to Love Field in Dallas. Love Field. That's the airport that uh, President Kennedy's body was taken to after he was killed in uh, Dallas and flown back to Washington. And uh, underneath the Lone Ranger statue at Love Field, uh, in parked cars next to each other, Tech Schramm and Lamar Hunt worked out a deal to merge the two football leagues. Uh, that would be announced on June 8th, 1966. But you just can't merge two football leagues without parental permission. The parental permission here is the House and the Senate, the United States Congress. And there's only one man, one man who could do that job. And it is that guy, Alvin Roy Pete Rosell. This is 1986 Fortune magazine. Uh, that picture of me and Pete. And somebody must have said something funny because Pete is laughing and I'm laughing. And I wore a tie in those days. So maybe he's laughing at me for wearing a tie. Uh, that is uh, the Southern District of New York Court, Foley Square, across the street from Richard Nixon's office. And I got to, uh, during those days, got to see both Foley Square and Nixon's office. That's a subject for another talk, Nixon's office. Anyway, Roselle uh, is the commissioner of the National Football League. He's in his seventh year as commissioner by this point. And one of the jobs as a commissioner is to be a lobbyist. Uh, Hazel Gluck was John McMullen's lobbyist when he owned the New York, uh, New Jersey Devils, rather, down in Trenton. Hazel made a lot of money being a sports lobbyist. Uh, Roselle was an old hand. Um, he was down in Capitol Hill in 1961 because he was watching what Lamar Hunt did with the American Football League and television and the eight teams in the uh, uh, AFL. And the eight teams were put together as one uh, for the purpose of selling it to TV. Roselle wanted that. He wanted what Major League Baseball had. They sold their 16, 18, and 20 teams back in the late 50s, early 60s to NBC. There were only two networks that mattered. Um, the AF, and they had an antitrust exemption, so they could do it. They got the antitrust exemption in 1922 uh, from the Supreme Court. But uh, the American Football League was flying under the radar. A guy by the name of Jay Michaels uh, put together the deal between the American Football League and the American Broadcasting Company. And that wasn't even a full network in those days. It was only half the network in 1960. In fact, Miami got an ABC affiliate uh, by starting at Channel 10 in 1960. Uh, the deal was cut by Jay Michaels. Uh, you might know Jay's son, Alan. Uh, I certainly do. I was on a TV show with him in 1999, produced by his sister, Susan. Uh, Al, Al Michaels is the voice of Sunday Night Football on NBC. He probably got some help. Nepotism goes a long way in radio and TV. Probably got some help because Jay Michaels cut that deal, but Al had to pay his dues as well. Uh, his first job was helping his mother on Let's Make a Deal with tickets going into the, into the theater to watch Monty Hall and Let's Make a Deal and choosing contestants. His next job was the dating game with Jim Lang. And uh, his job was to have pick out the three bachelorettes and pick out the bachelor. He was the matchmaker for Chuck Barris on that show. And then he went into sports broadcasting. So he was on Let's Make a Deal off camera and the dating game. Uh, but anyway, getting back to Roselle. So he wants what uh, the AFL has and what Major League Baseball has. And he uh, consults uh, with a judge in Philadelphia who handled some television litigation or presided over television lit litigation in the 1950s, Judge Alan Grimm. And he says, can we do this? And Grimm says, no, you can't. It would be a violation of antitrust laws. And so he decides, OK, uh, let's go to Congress. And uh, he calls up Emanuel Seller. Um, and he's the Brooklyn Democrat who had been there since the War of 1812. 
well, actually since 1920, but he was there 40 years by that point. And he calls uh, Seller and says, uh, we want what the AFL has and what Major League Baseball has. Can you give us a limited antitrust exemption so we could sell all 14 of our franchises as one entity to a television network? And um, Seller looks it over. Okay, we could do that. Two days through the house. Uh, one day, as does Keith Howard in Tennessee, one day through the Senate, gets up to John Kennedy's desk on September 30th of 1961. Uh, Kennedy signs the Sports Broadcast Act into law, which allowed the NFL to bundle its 14 franchises, sell it as one to either CBS or NBC in those days. And that meant that uh, the Mara family in New York would have the same amount of television money coming in as the Green Bay Packers and no longer would television stations have their little or big networks uh, in, the, in the NFL or the NFL teams would have their little or big television networks. The Giants got the most money, Packers got the least money and this evened everything out. And it helped propel the NFL into a different economic orbit. So it's back to Washington for Mr. Roselle. And he's got to convince the guy on the left, Russell Long, uh, Louisiana Democrat that uh, this is a good thing to do. And he's also got to convince uh, Hell Boggs, um, a Democrat from Louisiana. Yeah, this is the thing that you ought to do. Uh, but neither Russell Long, who's the Senate Majority Whip and the chairman of the Senate Financial Committee, nor Boggs, who was a very influential congressman back then, uh, were very excited about this planned football merger. In fact, they saw no upside. Why should they vote for it? Because New Orleans didn't have a team. And New Orleans wasn't going to get a team. And they told that to Roselle. And he said, well, if you're not going to move any teams, how about giving us an expansion team? And Roselle had, well, you know, he was hemming and hawing because they didn't want to go to New Orleans because of what was going on on the ground. Uh, he's hemming and hawing. Well, there's not enough players for 24 teams. We got 15. They got nine. You know, and it just maybe in a few years, maybe in a few years, we could do it. Uh, but these guys controlled a lot of votes, uh, two votes in Louisiana Senate for long, plus probably Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee and Arkansas and Oklahoma, and maybe, maybe, maybe Texas as well. And the same would hold true for Boggs and, and all the Congress people in that neck of the woods. So Roselle's got a problem here because these guys aren't going to budge. And, his, and he went down to Washington thinking that he was going to get this done uh, without New Orleans. But, you know, best, play, uh, best laid plans, mice and men. So Roselle comes back, talks to his owners and says, hey, let's see what we can work at. Let's see if we can do this. This is the idea. Jets are playing at Shea Stadium in Queens. Queens abuts Brooklyn. A lot of people in Brooklyn then end up at Shea Stadium either by train, um, Long Island Railroad, um, car, uh, subway, bus. And they can't get tickets to Giants games. But maybe, just maybe, just maybe we could figure something out. We'll go back to a manual seller and we are going to have uh, a plan for them. And this was the plan. Uh, originally, some teams were going to move to satisfy the Louisiana interests. The New York Jets, Sonny Werblin, he owns the team. Uh, Leon Hess, he's a member of the board of directors of ABC. These are Jersey guys. Phil Islin, Hess, Werblin. Werblin graduated Rutgers University. Hess had his headquarters, the Hess headquarters for gasoline. Uh, I think it's off Woodbridge uh, on, the, on the New Jersey Turnpike, the Hess building. But anyway... They're going to convince Sonny because of his showbiz connections that, hey, you know what? Maybe good if you, we can move you out to Los Angeles. And you got Joe Namath. And Joe, hey, look, Joe's the toast of the town here. He's the big man in Manhattan. He's doing commercials. He wants to be an actor. We, he could do that in Hollywood, too. So maybe we could get Sonny Whirlwind to move the franchise and, and everybody will be happy. We'll throw some money at Daniel Reeves. He'll take the Los Angeles Rams franchise down to San Diego which would replace the Chargers. You know, Baron Hilton doesn't really have any ties to San Diego. He started his first team, the Los Angeles Chargers, then moved to San Diego after a year. So, you know, he's got the business interests in New Orleans, the hotels and some other stuff. Yeah, let him take the Chargers to New Orleans and, and Oakland. Uh, we're going to move them out of the San Francisco Bay Area because, you know what, we want 24 teams in 24 cities. 
Uh, we don't want to have two teams in New York. We don't want to have two teams in San Francisco, Oakland, Bay Area, but we'll move them, but we'll take care of them eventually, but we'll get them in Seattle or Portland, Oregon. Um, and that was it. So he was going to go, he being Pete Rozell, to talk to Emmanuel Seller and see if he could sell him on this. But Seller's from Brooklyn. Lots of Jets fans is his, in his constituency. And that wasn't going to fly. Uh, the Seller Subcommittee on Antitrust uh, got assurances from Rozell. Remember, Seller did Rozell a big favor back in 1961. That there would be no teams moved because of the merger. None, none whatsoever. 24 teams, 22 cities. Oh, in 1970, we'll let some teams move if their stadiums don't have more than 50,000. And that would be the Chicago Bears. And George Hellas was not taking the Bears out of Chicago. And that would be the Minnesota Vikings. And they still had uh, years to go on their lease. So Seller puts a stop to that. And Joe Namath is going to stay. Broadway Joe. He isn't going to become Hollywood and Vine Joe. Uh, New Orleans. New Orleans is back in the thick of it. Uh, that's two years ago at Mardi Gras. Fire truck crew 2019. It's only two years ago. It seems like 40 with COVID. Hot nuts. Screwed that. They're passionate about their football team there. This guy uh, is on a float. And he's wearing a referee's uniform. Why? Because he feels that the New Orleans Saints in 2019 were jobbed that are going to the Super Bowl because of a blown pass interference call. He also wore dark glasses to show that the referees were blind as well. Uh, so there he is. Screw that. New Orleans. New Orleans comes into the NFL. Uh, Roselle convinces the owners we got to put a team in New Orleans or we this doesn't work. So he works out a deal with Hale Bonds. Congress approved the NFL AFL merger by giving the two competitors an antitrust exemption, which went like a rocket ship through Congress because it was put on as a rider to an anti inflation tax bill. Now, you tell me what Congress person, there were actually Congress women at the time. Patsy Mink uh, over in uh, Hawaii and others. Uh, that happens on October 21st, 1966. But you tell me what congressperson or what senator is going to say, yeah, you know what? At inflation, I love inflation. I'm going to vote against the bill. It went through the Senate and the House in a breeze. Uh, a grateful owner, William Clay Ford. Ford Motor Company also owns the uh, Detroit Lions football team back in those days. And now I know why the Etzel was a bomb and why Ford Motor Company was not all that great <laughs> in the 1960s and 70s. Just listen to this letter. The Honorable Gerald R. Ford Jr., House of Representatives, Washington, D.C. Okay, that's good. Honorable Ger Gerald R. Ford. Dear Mr. Ford, not Congressman Ford, Mr. Ford. A sincere thank you for your able assistance in bringing about congressional approval for the AFL-NFL merger. The passage of this bill will now allow merger plans to go ahead full speed. Important also is that the first championship game between the two leagues, he's got a capital L where you don't need a capital L in leagues, will now be played for real. You can play for real in January. Uh, this is an owner of the Ford Motor Company, and I'm not sure if he dictated this letter or if he actually wrote this letter, although there's the slash and JG, who probably was his secretary, wrote this letter. This letter was written like by second grader, Ford Motor Company. Anyway, there is the uh, father of the Super Bowl. The NFL would award the 16 franchise to New Orleans 11 days after the bill is passed. They said 10 but it was Halloween, so let's save it for All Saints Day. November 1st, 1966, New Orleans gets a franchise. Johnson signs the bill into law on November 8th, 1966 with that pen, which is on display at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Public Law 89-800, the Suspension of Credit Act, which carried a rider approving the merger of the National Football League and the American Football League. As far as those guys, none of them suffered who boycotted the game. Um, they have uh, at the Hall of Fame in uh, Canton, Ohio, a little display with those 22 guys. 
uh, HBO did a special on them uh, years later uh, about the boycott. And that's about it. That's about all you know about the boycott. Martin Luther King wasn't involved. The Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference wasn't involved. SNCC wasn't involved. These guys did it all by themselves. They put their career on the line uh, and Kemp, his political career on the line because they thought that they were doing something that was right. Meanwhile, Dave Dixon, remember Dave Dixon? Well, the National Football League owners pocketed $8 million in an expansion fee from the New Orleans owner, John Meekham. One of John Meekham's partners was Dave Dixon, the guy who was bitter after the AFL All-Star game. Dave Dixon gets his football franchise in the NFL. That was all split between 15 owners, about $470,000 per owner. Additionally, Werblin and Island and Hess, the Jets' ownership, have to pay Wellington Manor and Tim Manor $10 million because, quote-unquote, they invaded the New York Territory. It's actually Harry Wismer who did when he started the New York Titans in 1960. Those guys bought the Jets' franchise, called the Titans in those days, at a bankruptcy for a million dollars. Uh, the Oakland Raiders gave $8 million to the San Francisco 49ers ownership, the uh, Morabito family, uh, because that team invaded an NFL territory. The AFL would expand in 1968. They'd get $7.5 million. By the way, the average football team today is worth about $1.7 billion. They got $7.5 billion, uh, million dollars from Cincinnati uh, group that got an AFL expansion franchise, and that money went to NFL owners. So the NFL owners pocketed nearly a million dollars, with the exception of the Mara family. They got nearly $11 million in the San Francisco 49ers ownership. They got $9 million. They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything at all, except invite people to be part of their business. Now, here's a question for you about the Super Bowl. Did Vince Lombardi ever win a Super Bowl? Yes or no? I'll give you five seconds to answer that. If you want to try to answer that, put in the box. Did Vince Lombardi ever win one, two Super Bowls? Yes or no? Wait another minute. Okay, if I play the Murph Griffin Think song from Jeopardy, I'll have to pay Murph, so I'm not going to do that. But here is the answer. Uh, the Green Bay Packers and Kansas City Chiefs played in the first American Football League, National Football League World Championship game, January 15, 1967. The Green Bay coach, Vince Lombardi, didn't want to play the game. His team had already won the NFL championship, and he referred to the AFL as the Mickey Mouse League. And I can never understand why Mickey Mouse was second, third rate, cut rate, you know, cheap, whatever else. You know how much that rodent is really worth? Do you really know how much the rodent is worth? Um, Disney, the house the mouse built. Um, about 15, 16, 17 years ago, Comcast, the uh, nation's largest multiple system cable TV operator, tried a hostile takeover of Disney, offered $66 billion. Disney said no. They raised money to keep control of Disney. Wayne Gretzky. 1983, still people using that term by 1983. Edmonton beat the New Jersey Devils. It was something like uh, 12 to 3, the score. And Wayne Gretzky referred to the New Jersey Devils as a Mickey Mouse organization, second rate. And yet that rodent is worth so much money. A lot of empty seats for the first game. Los Angeles is a big event town. Dodgers, hey, people go see the Dodgers baseball. When the Lakers are really good and they have a superstar, whether it's uh, Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, LeBron James, uh, people go there. They flock to the arena to watch them play basketball. So it's a big event town. Academy Awards, you know, Hollywood premieres, all that other stuff. But this thing wasn't really a big event. Uh, it was played at the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, 94,000 seats. The ticket prices, by 1967 standards, thoroughly reasonable for a championship game. 12 bucks, 10 bucks, 6 bucks, 6 bucks to watch a championship game. 33,000 empty seats. Last time a Super Bowl or a World Championship game, not a seller. Lombardi won two American Football League, National Football League World Championship games. He never won a Super Bowl because his team never played in a Super Bowl. Oh, 
let's get back to uh, the rivalries here. Lombardi. Lombardi had a lot of pressure put on him, an awful lot of pressure put on him from William Paley, chairman of the board at CBS. He was told, hey, you're playing for the pride of CBS. You're playing for the pride of Walter Cronkite. You're playing for the pride of Ed Sullivan. You're playing for the pride of Mike Wallace. You're playing for the pride of Lucy. You're playing for the pride of Red Skelton. You're playing for the pride of Bud Collier on To Tell the Truth. Arlene Francis on What's My Line. Uh, Goober Pyle on Mayberry RFD. Gomer Pyle. You're playing for the pride of Gilligan. And Arnold the Pig on Green Acres. And also, Mr. Ed, you better win. The first game played January 15th, 1967, only 26 working days after the final approval of the merger between the two leagues. CBS and NBC televised it using the same television feed, but different announcers, different advertisers. Paley is leaning on Lombardi. You're coaching for CBS. But how important really was it? Well, if you look at it from the TV terms, it wasn't all that big a deal. Oh, yeah, they had the game and, and all that other stuff. But, 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 um, neither NBC nor CBS bothered to keeping the tape of the game. Oh, yeah, some tapes were sent out to Armed Forces Network so the troops could see it in the Philippines and South Vietnam and Japan, and South Korea, and Germany. Uh, but um, as far as domestic, uh, they taped the game and that was it. Um, they taped over it. They taped over shows like Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop. Uh, that was taped over in 1964 by NBC to for tape for the Democratic National Convention and the Republican National Convention. Tapes were big. They were about two inches, and, and the cylinders were heavy. They were heavy, and, and the tapes were big, and you had to store them in the proper uh, places. Ed Sullivan kept his. Uh, Johnny Carson was furious at NBC. They wiped out all of his New York, the entire New York run, and he didn't even know it. Uh, he started taping it around 1971 and keeping it. The NFL a few years ago, about seven, eight years ago, put out a $10 million reward for anybody, no questions asked. They have the tapes. We want them. We want them. They thought maybe some servicemen stuck it in a duffel bag, took it home with them, and threw it in an attic and forgot about it. But $10 million, nobody has come and get it. Uh, the game actually exists because there are some videos, pieces of videos, NFL films fills in what was missed and a radio broadcast. Uh, while Paley's going crazy about this game, they, well, you know what? We don't have to keep it. Uh, Jerry Kramer. Jerry Kramer was a guard with the Green Bay Packers back in 1966, 67, 68, when they went to the championship game. And uh, I keep all my interviews. I got about 500 of these with all my interviews on them. Uh, this is from 1988 when I spoke to Jerry Kramer. And he said, I was talking to Frank Gifford years ago, and he mentioned that he announced the first Super Bowl. Gifford said he was fairly cool, fairly calm, and relaxed. He went over to put his arm around Vince's shoulder, and Lombardi is shaking like a leaf. Of course, Gifford was uh, the uh, CBS announcer represented the NFL. Gifford said to Jerry Kramer, that really made me nervous. Uh, Vince Lombardi was the offensive coordinator of the New York Giants back in the 1950s. His favorite player of all time was Frank Gifford, who played on that team. Frank you know, executed for Vince. And Vince is now playing for Frank Gifford's pride. NBC, money, money, money. NBC and CBS. CBS and NBC charge $42,000 for a 30-second commercial. The two networks paid $9.5 million to televise the game. The leagues could not agree on which ball to use. When Green Bay was on offense, they used the Wilson Duke football, named after the New York Giants owner, Wellington Mara, as in the Duke of Wellington. When Kansas City had the ball, they used the AFL-sanctioned Spalding. I can't even say Spalding anymore. I lost my New York accent. We all bought Spaldings back in the 1960s. Spalding J5V football. There were rivals, Ford. They owned the Detroit Lions team. They put up a lot of money in advertising on CBS. And Pete Rozelle, the commissioner who lived about eight miles north of me in Harrison, uh, Pete Rozelle was driven every day to downtown Manhattan or midtown Manhattan 
in a Ford station wagon with a driver. So it was Ford against Chrysler, the NBC sponsor, two of the big three automakers. CBS against NBC. Uh, David Sarnoff was really mad at uh, Bill Paley for years and years and years. Uh, it goes back to 1948. Uh, Sarnoff uh, had Jack Benny, Burns and Allen, and others on the radio network, and uh, Paley pulled them. Their contracts were up. He offered them more money. They went to CBS. Fred Allen was the only one who stayed at NBC. And um, and, and Sarnoff didn't forget that. And he didn't forget that CBS got the rights to the NFL in 1962 and 1964. So there was a real rivalry between those two guys. NFL establishment sports writers Tex Moff, Sports Illustrated, who never had anything good to say about the AFL, and Kurt Gowdy, the uh, AFL NBC announcer, also the Boston Red Sox announcer, and also the NBC Baseball Game of the Week announcer. They nearly came to blows during the name of the Super Bowl in 1969. Uh, wasn't just a game. But that would all subside as Texas back, Texas E. Schramm told me. Uh, the Super Bowl kind of put the icing on the cake and the interest in the National Football League kept rolling until it was the most popular spectator sport in the United States. Tex had his numbers wrong. The Harris Poll in 1965, first time football surpassed baseball as the most popular sport in the United States. The Super Bowl was played January 15th, 1967 in that old venue in Los Angeles. Some people, and not some people, as Al Davis began calling the American Football League, National Football League, World Championship game, the Super Bowl in 1968. Davis's team, the Raiders, Oakland Raiders, played Green Bay in that game. Green Bay won the game. But what about the Super Bowl name? Well, nobody after the merger could come up with a proper name. I spoke to Roselle 35 years ago, and we talked about the name. And I said, how did it come about? He said, no, you know, Lamar Hunt. Uh, he, you know, the, the Super Bowl. I thought it was corny. He said, corny? He said, corny. Yeah. I said, I haven't heard that in 15 years. I said, last time I heard corny, I was about 13, 14 years old. He said, yeah, it was corny. It was like super duper, razzle dazzle, and, and looky, looky, here comes cookie. That's the kind of thing we talked about in the 1930s and 40s. I thought, you know, in the 1960s, it was corny. I haven't heard anybody use the word corny since Pete Rozelle did in the mid-1980s. But let's talk about the name. On July 25th, 1966, Hunt, Lamar Hunt writes uh, Rozelle a letter. I've kiddingly called it the Super Bowl, which obviously can be approved upon. Hmm, can it be approved upon? Let's think about that for a second. Can it be approved upon? Hmm. Uh, well, you know, I got a chance to talk to Lamar. This is the late 1990s. We're out in Palm Springs, California, an NFL owners meeting. And I brought up my conversation with, uh, with Pete. And uh, he said, you know, it's one of the spur of the moment things. No one ever said what we're going to call it. It was one of those things that just came out of the mouth. He was not too inspired. Hmm. Let's think about that for a second. I'm going to be 65 years old in April. So I was obviously around in the mid-1960s. I was seven, eight years old when this great toy came out. The toy was a little ball. And you threw it against the wall, and it bounced all over the place. It bounced crazy all over the place. And you chase it, you pick it up, throw it against the wall, and it bounced, and bounced, and bounced, and bounced. I was growing up in Woodside, Queens. We really didn't have any money. so But I didn't know. I was eight years old. I didn't know we didn't have any money. But Lamar probably was living in a uh, palatial estate outside of Dallas. And um, his son, Clark, who's my age, who now owns the Kansas City Chiefs, um, he had the same toy, yeah, exact same toy. Well, maybe I should let Lamar explain this. Uh, Lamar is home one day watching his children play with a ball when he first uttered the words. They each had a Super Bowl that my wife had given to them. And they were always talking about them. And I just used the expression Super Bowl. It was an accidental thing. I don't know how accidental it was. Because I remember those days. All we did was talk about that Super Bowl. It was the greatest thing going. You could play by yourself. Throw it against the wall. Bounce, bounce, bounce. I had a blue Super Bowl. I love my Super Bowl. I don't know what color Clark's Super Bowl was. But I had a blue one. And that's a yellow one. It was put out by Whammo, the Whammo Super Bowl. As far as the Whammo Super Bowl, its shelf life considerably less than Super Bowl. It was a toy made of Zectron. 
a chemical engineer, Norman Stingley, found that when formed under 50,000 pounds of pressure, Zectron becomes uncontrollably bouncy. Whammo began producing a ball made of Zectron in 1964. So you know where I am in New York in 1964? I'm eight years old and I'm watching Channel 5. I may be watching Chuck McCann. I might be watching Soupy Sales, Sandy Becker, Sonny Fox, who passed away about 10 days ago, who I knew, um, from Wonderama and Just for Fun. Or I'm watching Channel 11 with Captain Jack McCarthy in the Popeye cartoons or Officer Joe Bolton in Three Stooges. And there was a commercial right in the middle of the show all the time from Whammo, the Super Bowl. The double top secret. Oh, man, the double top secret. That must have been something. And then pressed an eight-year-old. Double top secret formula for Zektron. Well, it wasn't a double top secret. It was copied by Whammo's competitors. And the Super Bowl would quit bouncing and would be out of production by 1976. That's where the name comes from. Uh, that's Broadway Joe, and that is me with hair and a white piece of paper on the right. That's my buddy Bruce Morton on the left. Bruce sometimes joins me. He's in Denver now on these talks. And um, there's Joe, and we're talking about the New York Jets and the Super Bowl, January 12th, 1969, the 20th anniversary of the Super Bowl um, that year. And that's up at the Wingfoot Golf Course up here in Mamaroneck, about uh, four or five miles from my house. And uh, we're talking. And, you know, history, history is written by the winners, right? They have interesting stories. The losers never have interesting stories. But, you know, I got a chance to talk to the ultimate loser of the Super Bowl, a guy by the name of Lou Michaels, uh, the ultimate loser. Nobody has lost as much as Lou Michaels did on that day, January 12, 1969. Here's a kicker with the Baltimore Colts. His brother, Walt Michaels, was the defensive coordinator of the New York Jets. And, uh, well, what, you know what, why don't I let Lou tell the story? Because this is January 5th, 1969 at a bar in Fort Lauderdale. Joe Namath walks in with Jim Hudson. They spot Lou Michaels, who looks exactly the same as his brother, Walt Michaels, the defensive coordinator of the Jets. And Joe recognizes him. And Joe leaves. And then he comes back with Jim Hudson screaming and yelling. But let's let Lou Michaels tell you the story from about 30 years ago. I must say, Joe is a very cocky individual. I never expected that from Joe when he walked into the place he had a fur coat on. I'll never forget it. A fur coat in Miami. And he points over to me instead of saying, hi, I'm Joe Namath. I thought he was going to introduce himself and say hello. He points over to me and says, we're going to kick the out of you. And I'm going to be the one to do it. Joe had told everybody, everybody and anybody who was in Fort Lauderdale as they practiced for the game, the Jets were going to win. Four quarterbacks in the AFL, better than Oral Morrow. We could move the ball against the Baltimore Colts defense. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning author, Dave, uh, rather columnist and author, Dave Anderson of the uh, New York Times told me once years ago, the late Dave Anderson, how confident Namath was all week. And he'd tell anybody and everybody that Jets were going to win, including these two women. Oh, I could just imagine these two women. They're sitting, um, they're all at a, on the beach in Fort Lauderdale. Joe's got a chase lounge on the beach. I don't know if he paid money for the chase lounge. You know, someplace you got to pay five bucks for it. And he's got his own towel. Look at behind his left cheek there where the woman has her hand over the Jets logo. And he's there. He's holding court. There's Paul Zimmerman of Sports no Illustrated. Uh, and there is, uh, he was with the New York Post in those days and Larry Fox uh, with the Daily News and others. But these two women are walk by. I can just picture this conversation. All these New Yorkers down in Fort Lauderdale. This is early January. They're out of the snow. It's after the holidays. They're there for the winter. And I could just hear this. Sylvia, you think that's him? I don't know, Trudy. Well, what do you think? You think we should go over? Yeah, we should go over. You know, it looks like him. Well, why don't we go ask him? Uh, is that you? Is that you? Yeah, it's me. Yeah, is that you? Yeah, we're going to win. Oh, wait until we tell the girls back home. They're never going to believe it. Too bad we don't have our, all the girls at Marja. They're never going to believe it. It's too bad we don't have a camera. There were cameras there. This was on the back page of the Daily News of the New York Post. 
probably the Bergen record and the Newark Star Ledger and this color picture was in Sports Illustrated. So the two women had proof that they talked to Joe and look at Joe, he's all smiles there. He doesn't care. This is a Super Bowl news conference. I can't imagine Tom Brady sitting on Clearwater Beach right now with all these people around him smiling and talking about the game. That guy in the blue shirt doesn't really care. He must have worked in the garment district. You know, he, Garmentos didn't really care. That woman back there, she didn't care either. But these two women made it a point to go over there and see Joe. The game is the turning point. Namath guarantees the Jets win. He delivers, more importantly, because of Joe. And there's a change of the name to Super Bowl, complete with num Roman numerals, one, two, three. The Super Bowl takes on a new life. When people went to that game, four o'clock in the afternoon, Sunday, January 12th, they had no idea that right before their very eyes, American culture, American culture was about to change. In fact, uh, you could still get the ticket up to kickoff that Sunday afternoon. Uh, it's a big deal now. Everything around the Super Bowl, there are parties in non-COVID years. Um, you know, there are bets being made in the house. Um, there are people lined up with food. Uh, people watch the pregame show and uh, they watch the national anthem singer. And of course, they watch the commercials and they watch the halftime show. And by the way, there is a football game taking place as well. Back in 1969, I did meet one guy in Long Island once said, we had a party at the house and I, I have never met anybody else. He said, I was a Jets fan. We're celebrating. We watched the game. I had a party at my house. Nobody else has ever mentioned to me that they had a party at their house back in 1969. Uh, there was a flimsy pregame show featuring a marching band in these Mr. Machine looking things. That was a toy in the 1960s with uh, Baltimore Colts and New York Jets jerseys on them. The Apollo 8 astronauts, Frank Borman, William Anders, and Tom Hanks. Actually, Jim Lovell, Tom Hanks played Jim Lovell in Apollo 13, had just circled the moon two weeks earlier and led the crowd in a rousing rendition of the Pledge of Allegiance. The national anthem performed by a trumpet player, Lloyd Geisler. The Florida A&M University marching band performed the halftime show. That was it. It was just a football game. Jets win the game. Namath runs off the field with his finger like that. Number one, number one, number one. And that was it. It was just a football game. In fact, the Jets were so blasé, they forgot to bring the Super Bowl championship trophy back to New York for the next day uh, celebration at New York City Hall with uh, John Lindsay. They had to fly somebody there, picked up the trophy, fly them back. Tiger Ferraro, he got a police escort back to lower Manhattan, and the trophy was there in time for the Jets celebration. Getting back to Lou Michaels. Well, he's insulted by Namath. And his team loses 16 to seven. And there's one more, there's one more. His brother was a defensive coordinator with the Jets and the two brothers agreed, well, we'll each take $8,000. That's the base salary for losing 8,000. The winner got 15,000, it's an extra 5,000. So the brothers come to an agreement. Whoever wins the game, that extra 5,000, the Padre at the church in Swoyersville, Pennsylvania, the Padre, you know, you look at the church, it's a bit run down, needs some repairs. And that $5,000 will go a long way to help the church in Sawyersville. We went there in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, growing up as kids there. So, you know, that's a good thing. Well, Walt wins, runs back to Sawyersville, puts up all kinds of Jets memorabilia. Lou gets there a few days later because he knows Walt is celebrating with the family. And um, somebody says to Lou, you know, you better talk to your brother. He hasn't given us $5,000. What do you mean? Didn't give us $5,000. Walt refused to pay off his bet. Out of that $8,000, Lou Michaels took $5,000 so the church in Swoyersville would be fixed up. Um, caused a rift between the brothers for a, a while. Uh, January 12, 1969, the most important day in NFL history in a lot of ways because culture has changed. The Super Bowl is accepted as a major event because the Jets win. The AFL was on par with the established league, the NFL, as Pete Rozelle said, I hated the Colts losing, but you know what? It was the best thing for us. We had a hot property. Super Bowl now is a national holiday and the most watched TV event of the year in the United States, 140 million viewers. Pales by comparison to India-Pakistan cricket, 600 million viewers, but 
does well for the United States. Lou Michaels, January 5th, had no idea that a chance barroom, uh, barroom showdown with Namath, January 5th, 1969, would lay the foundation in turning the Super Bowl into a national obsession. That's Pat Mahomes from last year's game, the uh, quarterback for the winning Kansas City Chiefs. And there's Andy Reid taking the uh, Super Bowl trophy, the Kansas City coach. Um, Vince Lombardi obviously never won the Super Bowl. They renamed the uh, Tiffany Trophy, the Super Bowl trophy, after Lombardi in 1970, after he passed away from cancer. Uh, Lombardi also has a rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike named after him. Going north, it's the first, it's the last one. Coming south, it's the first one after the George Washington Bridge by the Meadowlands. Uh, what you don't know about Lombardi, he broke the quota. He was a civil rights pioneer. By 1967, Green Bay had 13 black athletes on the field, including all pros Willie Davis, Willie Wood, Dave Robinson, Herb Adderley, and Bob Jeter. Lombardi felt that he was passed over in the 1950s to get a head coaching job in the NFL. He was Sicilian, and that his dark complexion uh, made him unsuitable for any NFL team. He also had gay players on his teams. He told his players, I don't want to hear anything. His brother, Tom, a priest in New Jersey, was gay. Lombardi from Englewood, New Jersey. The Queen Mary. The Queen Mary is there. I spoke on that ship behind the Queen Mary. That's a uh, Princess Cruz's ship. Uh, and the Queen Mary has a uh, big place in Super Bowl changing the culture of the Super Bowl, American culture. Because in 1973, my friend Shelley Saltman, who had promoted Ali Frazier in 71 at the Garden and was about ready to promote the Battle of the Sexes, uh, Bobby Riggs and Billie Jean King, and you might have that DVD in, in the library, um, told me, he said, uh, there was this big party uh, before Super Bowl VII uh, in Long Beach, San Pedro, on the docked Queen Mary, which is a hotel, and anybody who's anybody in Hollywood was there, who's around Hollywood, Dean Martin and all, who happened to be in town. Uh, and people heard about the party and said, wait a minute, if they could have a party, why can't we have a party? We should have a party too. And I'm going to do this Madden style. There is uh, me, Dennis Steele to the right, who is one of the guys who were on the uh, syndicated Madden show, and me, uh, Sync Sound uh, in uh, Manhattan, 10th Avenue and 56th Street. So we're going to do this Madden style. I don't have a telestrator. If I did, I could do it completely Madden. Hey, uh, hey, there are your burgers. Uh, uh, the dogs are there. That's good. You got the dogs. You got the burgers. You got the wings over there. You know, you got your dip. You got your chips. You got your dip. Uh, you got your cup. So we have something to drink. Uh, hey, 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 look. Hey, boom. Ketchup. Ketchup and mustard. Boom. Where's the rye bread? Need the rye bread. Ketchup and mustard on rye bread. My favorite sandwich. It's party time. It's party time. And that is true. Ketchup and mustard on rye bread is John's favorite sandwich. I spent 15 years trying to figure out working with him. And, and I'm still friendly with the family. John's not in good shape these days. Try to figure out why he liked ketchup and mustard on rye so much. Every community in America is touched by the Super Bowl. Stores sell big screen TVs. My wife said the other day she got a thing from Costco uh, on sale. She said, look, look, that's what you talk about, right? The big screen TV sale at Costco this week. Uh, supermarkets have super sales. Not Super Bowl sales, but super sales because the NFL come down on them for using the trademark Super Bowl. Except if there's a marketing partner, beer or whatever it is, uh, they could use Super Bowl as part of the NFL promotion. There is such a thing as the Beer Institute. Uh, years ago, I uh, had lunch with Lori Levy, who was with the Beer Institute, and she pointed out how big a party day the Super Bowl really was. Second biggest food consumption day of the year behind Thanksgiving. There's your big old TV. You get 84 inches now, 84 inch TV. According to the National Electronics Dealers Association, sales of large, large screen TVs increase 500% during the Super Bowl week because the event increases the demand for television sets to watch the big game. The NFL tried to copyright the big game and was laughed out of court. Beer here, beer here. The Beer Institute has data that suggests the Super Bowl is one of the seven biggest sales days of the year. Uh, only behind Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, and Fourth of July. Some years it might be more than those holidays. By the way, the Super Bowl Sunday party 
it's a bigger party day now than New Year's Eve. Newspapers sell advertising for special Super Bowl sections. They could get away with it because there's editorial within that section. Uh, and the NFL won't go after them because of the editorial content. The Super Bowl is a moneymaker for supermarkets, department stores, bars, snack food makers, breweries, restaurants. Pizza sales are up about 67% that day. It's also a springboard for companies to start their annual TV, radio, and print advertising campaigns. The actual event takes second place as a news event. In fact, it's secondary. People talk about the commercials, the halftime show, the pregame show, um, and about what they brought, what food's around, what they're betting on, all that other stuff. And the NFL loves that, because, particularly rating the TV commercials. The new TV commercials for this weekend were leaked on Twitter. Leaked on Twitter. They weren't leaked. People want, they're proud of their product. Uh, and uh, the commercials, rating the commercials, major part of the entertainment package. The biggest ad still, 42 years later, the Coca-Cola ad with the Pittsburgh Steelers defensive lineman, Big, uh, Mean Joe Green, coming off the field. This was done down the road at the old Mount Vernon Stadium, which is now being replaced. And the kid wants to get Mean Joe Green's attention and finally does with the Coca-Cola. Uh, oh, Joe, 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 pantyhose. Joe had a good success after the Super Bowl. Hosted his own TV show with Dick Schaap and Louisa Moritz. Uh, he did uh, a movie with Raquel Welsh. Did a Noxzema commercial with the then unknown Farrah Fawcett. And in the mid-1970s, Jimmy Walsh had him doing Haynes Pantyhose commercial. And over the years, I've had some women say to me, why can't we see his legs? Said, you don't want to see his legs now. All those scars from knee operations and all. Oh, no, no, not today. Not today. We want to see it from the Pantyhose commercial. And I said, like that? Oh, yeah, just like that. And then they went off into dreamland. Uh, oh, and Joe today. Medicare coverage helpline. I'm glad I called for dentures, for hearing aids, for glasses, even rides. I'm glad I called. That's what Joe is pitching today. Joe is going to be 78 years old in May. Some of the best commercials, the Mean Joe Green Coca-Cola commercial in 1979, the Apple Sledgehammer co computer commercial, 1984, Coke Guy Takes a Pepsi in 1996, Tabasco Sauce Mosquito, 1998, also 1998, 3D Doritos, 2003, Budweiser, the Clydesdales. There will be no Clydesdales at the Super Bowl on Sunday. Budweiser, for the first time in 37 years, is not advertising. They're instead taking the advertising money, putting into COVID-19 educational funds to get people vaccinated. 2003, Reebok, Terry Tate, office linebacker. 2010, Snickers, Betty White, about 10 days ago, was 99 years old. She was a mere child of 88 when she did that commercial in 2010 with Abe Vigoda. Uh, we wrap up the Super Bowl with the politics of the Super Bowl. As you know, it was created by Congress. In 1998, January of 1998, because I was there when the announcement was made, Bill Bidwell took his Phoenix Cardinals, or rather his St. Louis Cardinals football team, and moved them to Phoenix, actually Tempe, Arizona, the next town over where Sun Devil Stadium was. Uh, Bidwell left St. Louis because he felt that uh, attendance wasn't all that good, and he was hoping that the attendance would pick up dramatically in Phoenix, but it didn't. And the NFL, by 1990, realized they had a Phoenix problem and a lot of empty seats. So as a sweetener to get more people to buy tickets to Cardinals football, they gave Bill Bidwell the 1993 Super Bowl hoping that more people would buy tickets, get into a lottery, and get 1993 Super Bowl tickets in Tempe. Uh, Martin Luther King Day. Uh, Ronald Reagan creates the holiday in the mid-1980s, and in 1986, the governor of Arizona, Bruce Babbitt, makes it a holiday, a state holiday in Phoenix, but there's a new governor one in 1986, Evan Meacham, and in January, that one of the first things he did was cancel the Martin Luther King holiday. And he said, because there are too many holidays, and besides, Babbitt didn't have the authority to create the holiday by government, uh, uh, by his order, government, uh, not government agreement, an executive order. Bidwell took the team to Tempe in 1988 and arrives in the middle of uh, what is a state squabble. 
Martin Luther King in the big game. Stevie Wonder said he wasn't performing in Arizona. Convention planner said, we're not coming to the state. The battle was on. In 1989, the state legislature did pass legislation that would create the holiday honoring King. But opponents managed to get enough signatures on petitions to get voters in the state to decide whether or not to honor King in the 1990 of November election. Uh, the NFL said to uh, Arizona uh, voters, uh, pass this and you got the 93 Super Bowl. Turn it down, we're pulling the Super Bowl. Arizona voters said no, and the NFL pulled Super Bowl 27 from Tempe, moved it out to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. By 1992, the presidential year, uh, Clinton, Perot, and Bush, uh, a lot of voters are going to come out, and um, organizers got the King Day initiative on the ballot again, and the NFL said, you pass it, this is your last chance. But if you pass it, you get the 96 game. You don't, you'll never get one. Uh, the voters passed it, and the NFL in March of 1993 awarded Tempe the game. The national anthem, the Giants beat Buffalo that day in Tampa. But uh, more importantly, most people around the United States don't care that the Giants beat Buffalo. In New Jersey, you probably do. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Gulf War breaks out the summer of 1990. This thing is a fortress, uh, Tampa Stadium. And Whitney Houston performs the national anthem. And it's the anthem that other anthems are judged by. Uh, maybe the greatest performance of the anthem. And the question is, was it live or was it on tape? I'll let Jim Steig tell you. Jim Steig is a guy I've known for a very long time. And he was in charge of that Super Bowl's activities. In early January 1991, our coordinator of the Super Bowl uh, pregame activities, Bob Best, produced a recording of the Florida Orchestra for national anthem producer Ricky Minor. A week later, Minor flew to Los Angeles to have Whitney record the vocal track, amazingly done in one take. 2004, Houston, Texas. The New England Patriots beat the Carolina Panthers 32-29, Tom Brady, the quarterback of uh, New England at that time. And uh, well, Nobody remembers New England beating Carolina, but they do remember this, Justin Timberlake and Janet Jackson and the costume malfunction. Janet Jackson's costume malfunction at halftime of the 2004 game caused a political football and changed how TV and radio presented programming. ABC showing scheduled for Easter Sunday, 2004, of Saving Private Ryan is impacted. This is about seven weeks later. After the Super Bowl incident, Michael Powell and the FCC dug in and started to go after other areas for indecency or questionable images on TV. By October 2004, the Commissioner Powell, Colin Powell's son, and his FCC colleagues started thinking whether or not a hockey game, which features an occasional fight here or there, with suitable programming between 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Forgetting there's at least five fights on every play in football, but it's football. The FCC, back to Timberlake and Janet Jackson. They act. Justin Timberlake grabbed Janet Jackson in a dance routine, accidentally forcing open her dress, which revealed one of her breasts. That nine sixteenths of a second left an impression. Faster than an eye blink. So who saw it? Nobody. Nobody. She was like that immediately. However, however, there was social media. And before there was Facebook, there was AOL instant messaging, Yahoo messaging, and whatever Hotmail had at that point as a messenger. Uh, and people started talking. Hey, did you see what I saw at halftime? No, I didn't. Do you have TiVo? Yes, I do. Go to TiVo. Go back to the halftime show. Slow it down. Slow it down. Slow it down. Slow it down. Oh, there it is. There's the one frame. Wow, there it is. By the end of the game, people were knew what was going on, and people started condemning um, CBS, Viacom, Viacom CBS, Viacom MTV, which produced the halftime show. Within 15 hours, politicians gathered on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, pointing a finger at Jackson and CBS for promoting something immoral. The hammer would come down on CBS, the Republican FCC majority, who's ever in the White House, 
It's George W. Bush then, has the majority on the FCC, five members. Uh, they got involved. Viacom CBS was fined $500,000 and then decency rules would be changed and everything would be put on a tape delay on TV and radio so somebody could cut out whatever is deemed indecent. Viacom CBS fought the fight, fines for seven years and won. That applies only to over-the-air TV and over-the-air radio. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, Steven Spielberg film starring Tom Hanks, Saving Private Ryan, Edward Burroughs, Matt Damon, Tom Sizemore, the mission is a man. The FCC raised the amount stations and networks could be docked for what could be termed questionable images and dirty words. 2004, the owners of TV stations scared off by the prospects of fines. 66 Walt Disney ABC TV affiliates, mostly in the South in the United States, did not show the movie Saving Private Ryan because of foul language concerns. They didn't want to risk a fine. Saving Private Ryan won five Oscars following its release in 1998. It had aired on ABC twice, Easter Sunday 2001, Easter Sunday 2002. Military and veterans groups were furious with the stations. Disney ABC offered to pay the fines in 66 stations if the FCC decided to dock them. There was only one complaint prior to that. That was in 2002. One complaint about foul language. After that, nobody cared. But the NFL did. No more risque halftime shows. No, 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 no. We're going to do safe acts like Paul McCartney, who was busted in Tokyo for pot, spent nine days in a Japanese jail. His bandmate, John Lennon, would not leave the United States because he feared that he was not going to come back. He faced deportation because of a drug bust back in London in 1968. George Harrison had some problems with a drug bust. Ringo Starr had to go to dry, he had to literally dry out uh, in 1988. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album, Speedballs, Acid, went into making that album. He was a safe act. Rolling Stones, here's Keith Richards. Next, uh, The Who. Pete Townsend, Roger Daughtry, two of the four founding members of The Who. The drummer there is Zach Starkey, Ringo Starr's son. Because Keith Moon, the original drummer, died from a uh, reaction to a diet drug that he took because he gained so much weight taking drugs. John Entwistle, uh, the bass player, died uh, after taking cocaine. Um, but they were a safe act. New Jersey's Bruce Springsteen, Mariah Carey, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, Justin Timberlake twice. He came back. Janet Jackson never did. Beyonce, McCartney, The Rolling Stones, The Who, Whitney Houston, Lady Gaga have performed during the event's pre-game and halftime ceremonies. You're not going to see up with people anymore. Super Bowl. It was part of a civil rights movement or came out of the civil rights movement by those guys in New Orleans. Uh, it is now a cultural fixture on the American calendar every February, and it's a political force. Uh, the Martin Luther King Day uh, holiday in uh, Arizona, the, the new indecency rules on television. Um, so it's more than a game. It's far more than a game. Mary Grace, thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the library in Sussex for inviting me. Uh, my name is Evan Weiner, and uh, the floor is all yours now. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Evan. It was excellent. Thank you.